Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the last lecture of the 2020 Saturday Physics for Everyone series, sponsored by the Department of Physics here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. My name is Patrick Snyder. I'm the coordinator of this series, and today I'm happy to present to you the final lecture of the Saturday Physics for Everyone series, which is designed to give high schoolers and the general public the opportunity to hear from world-class scientists, researchers, and artists on the modern aspects of physics and how physics relates to the broader world around us. Now, for those of you who are just turn, tuning in to your first Saturday physics, welcome, and we hope you enjoy this and continue to tune in next fall. And for those longtime fans of this series, thanks for all your continued support and attendance of this series. Now we know that COVID has disrupted nearly every part of our daily lives, and we're just happy that we can continue this series. And whatever the future may hold, just know that with your continued support, we'll continue to run this 28 year old tradition in whatever format is required. So also as attendees of any past lectures of this year, we'll, uh, we'll be notified of any future lectures and related department events. So for today, let me give you a little breakdown of how today's event will go. First, I'll present Professor Yoni Khan, faculty sponsor for the Saturday Physics for Everyone program. And he'll introduce today's uh, special guest speakers, Lindsay Olson and Dr. Kirsty Duffy. Now, today's session is scheduled to last until 1130 Central Time, and will include a Q&A session in the mid um, middle of the talk, as well as at the end of the talk. So questions and comments will be taken from attendees at today's presentation. So I encourage all of you to submit your questions by clicking the chat or Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. So without further ado, let me present to you theoretical physicists and faculty sponsor of today's um, Saturday Physics for Everyone program, Professor Yoni Khan. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be introducing um, today's pair of speakers. It's a really uh, wonderful story behind uh, how we all got in touch. Um, so first of all, so Lindsay Olson is Fermilab's first artist in residence. Um, she's done a lot of really interesting artistic work um, illustrating aspects of high energy physics, which is of course the, the field that I study. Um, Lindsay contacted me actually last fall, a little over a year ago, um, to talk about possibly presenting at a uh, Saturday Physics for Everyone uh, event or some other kind of, of outreach event. We were really excited. Um, we were planning all sorts of things. And then of course the pandemic hit, um, but nonetheless, we were so thrilled that she was able to present at this series for us even in this remote format. And I think that, you know, um, so I also have some, you know, some interest in, in the arts as you, you might've known from uh, my introduction to um, Professor Vishishvara a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, as a performing artist, sometimes having restrictions actually makes you more creative in a way. It forces you to work around those restrictions and, you know, generate something, you know, within the confines of um, the, the system that you're working in. And so I think that, you know, having to adapt to this virtual format has actually led to some really interesting, um, you know, artistic choices about the kind of things um, that these speakers are gonna, gonna talk about and present. Um, so uh, we also have Dr. Kirsty Duffy, who's a neutrino physicist at Fermi Labs. That's also another aspect of high energy physics, but one that I'm a little bit less familiar with. So I'm looking forward to learning um, something new about her work today. Um, and so I'm just so thrilled to have uh, these speakers talk about, you know, the connections between art and science and especially the relationship to high energy physics, which is near and dear to my heart. So with that, um, I'll let our speakers for today uh, take it away. Thank you so much. So thank you for um, inviting Dr. Duffy and I to speak with you today. I've learned recently through Yoni and Patrick and others that the University of Illinois Physics Department is an absolute hotbed for art and science. So I'm delighted to be here today to support these two very powerful expressions of our humanity. So I make art about science and my work takes me out of the studio to places like this, a cavernous ring of equipment designed to accelerate tiny bits of matter at near the speed of light. Here, scientists want to crack open the secrets of neutrinos and I want to explain it through art. For many people, science seems like an insurmountable subject and one of those people included me. But this changed when I realized that I could use my training as an artist to learn scientific concepts. Earlier in my career, I had been painting idealized views of the Chicago area waterways, but I had been editing out the built environment, things like bridges and parking lots and power lines, and that sort of thing. 
But one day when my husband and I were canoeing past this cow sag channel, uh, SEPA station, I was noticing that it was in a very obscure location and somebody had spent a lot of money building this artificial water fountain. Um, and so it kind of troubled me and I, I was really curious about it. And finding out who built it and why led me to the world's largest wastewater treatment plant in Stickney, Illinois. And once there, I suddenly realized that I could use my training as an artist to learn enough engineering and science to tell the real story of water in a dense urban area. And I know this is going to sound really strange, but I actually fell in love with science in the middle of that very wastewater treatment plant. So Georgia Schwender is the curator of Fermilab's art gallery, and she had heard about one, one of my projects. So she invited me out to the lab for a tour. And while we're in the middle of the art gallery pictured here, uh, she turned to me and she said, you know, I've been really wanting to set up an artist residency for years. Would you like to help me do this? And for both Georgia and I, it was a big goosebumps moment. And my first thought was, gosh, wow, someone is actually inviting me to do the work that I love. It took about 18 months of patient pestering to get in at the um, water treatment plant. But my second thought was, oh my God, this is high energy physics. Can I really learn enough science to make meaningful art? But of course the offer was too good to refuse and I accepted this offer with both trepidation and with excitement. <clears throat> Fermilab actually has a very long tradition of collaborations with the arts and science. Um, Fermilab's first, uh, the founding director of Fermilab, Dr. Uh, Robert Wilson, was himself both an artist and a scientist. And if you come for a tour when things open up again, you'll see many of his gigantic sculptures um, on the properties, especially the when you come in, when you just first enter the property, you can see one of his enormous sculptures there. And so working across disciplines can be kind of challenging, but people at the lab were so gracious and so many people spent lots of time sharing their expertise with me uh, during my residency and after my residency, I might add. So early in the project, someone handed me a book by Dr. Don Lincoln, who is a senior scientist at Fermilab. And in the first chapter, he describes the standard model. Now, most of us are familiar with the periodic chart of elements. All the elements are organized according to their atomic weight. The standard model is to physics, what the periodic chart is to chemistry. But instead of dealing with atoms, the standard model expresses life on the subatomic realm. It describes what's happening inside protons and neutrons. So this is what the standard model looks like to those of us without mathematical training. But this is actually what it looks like. It's like a one page equation. This is the Lagrange equation. One of the biggest obstacles to learning about high energy physics was accepting that particles behave differently in the quantum realm. It's counterintuitive to the ways in which we perceive reality. And life on the quantum realm is so weird, you really don't need any illegal substances to completely blow your mind. And I actually struggled to learn this material until I figured out that I had to make space in my thinking for two versions of reality. The reality that I experience through my senses on a daily basis and the reality that physicists have discovered on the quantum scale. And one example among many of this dual version of reality is that things that appear solid to us are in fact made up of fields of wiggling, jiggling particles. So many artists use oil paint and watercolor or other traditional materials. But when I create my art, I want to figure out a way to have the least amount of distance between the art and the science. So everyone uses textiles in their daily lives. So creating work from them felt like a natural choice. The study of physics is ancient. So I wanted to include colors that suggest antiquity. I've also used a democratic use of high-end uh, silks and laces with workaday fabrics like denim and canvas. I also chose blackboard paint, which is used right on here, this portion, um, because blackboards are actually ubiquitous at the lab. Um, there's blackboards in people's offices, obviously, in the hallways. There's even a set of blackboards outside the women's bathroom on the second floor in Wilson Hall. This is a close-up of that piece. So some of the parts of this artwork look like unfinished pages of a book. 
And um, they only look unfinished because I've actually stabilized them all with um, clear matte medium. But I'm using this kind of expression of uh, unfinished books to suggest that scientific inquiry isn't finished. It's always ongoing. I use a lot of time consuming hand processes in making these pieces like beading and embroidery and stitching. Um, this piece is called Nuts and Bolts, and it's a beaded timeline, suggesting a kind of royal road of the discovery of particles. Now, historically, beading and hand embroidery were used on luxury clothing, and using these sorts of processes to create the art elevates the subject matter. There's a little close-up of that piece, too. The standard model of particle physics has been hugely successful in predicting particles, including the Higgs boson, whose existence was experimentally confirmed in 2012. However, after years of predict, pre correctly predicting particles, physicists know that the standard model does not tell the complete story. So in this piece, I have provisionally attached the standard model right here with these little ties. Um, to kind of express this idea that the standard model may have to be substantially changed as new theories are developed. I've left room for this discovery of particles in the center of the piece, and um, my artwork, like current theories, may prove to be obsolete one day. So um, when I showed, this was the first piece that I created, and when I brought it in to show my science advisor, Don Lincoln, I said to him, you know, can you find the Higgs particles? <clears throat> Excuse me. So he's looking and he's looking, and he's flipping up these pages and he goes, no, I can't find it. So I said, well, look carefully on the background. And he was like, oh my God, I'm totally blown away. I had deliberately added a hidden element for the Higgs particle because it took so long to discover it. I mean, decades and decades of work by many, many people to discover um, the Higgs particle. That's just one way I'm integrating science into the pieces. During my residency, I was invited to join a group of scientists and artists working at CERN as part of the Art at CMS group. The Large Hadron Collider is the largest machine human beings have ever built and houses four experiments. Inside the Large Hadron Collider, two beams of protons are traveling in opposite directions at near the speed of light. And eventually the two beams are aligned and the collisions of these particle beams are studied at four experiments around the ring. One of these experiments is called the compact muon solenoid, and it houses a custom-built camera that's 15 meters high. When I traveled to Geneva, Switzerland, I also had the opportunity to visit a book exhibition at the Martin Bodmer Library. They had a spectacular exhibition of medieval illuminated manuscripts. These ancient texts were the inspiration for a group of pieces related to research conducted at CERN. In the studio, I created a kind of collision myself between medieval illuminated manuscripts and this experiment. Illuminated manuscripts were used to transmit the most important information of their day. And I wanted to create a modern day illuminated manuscript that helps tell the story of the science conducted at CERN. This piece may not look like a book, but if you look in the very center, there's a brad that holds all these skinny pages together. And um, that's kind of not unlike the paint chip books that you might find at the hardware store. In this piece, I've created origami boxes and inside the boxes are questions that physicists would very much like to answer. So some of those questions are, why do the forces have such disparate strengths and ranges? Why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? And is there something smaller inside quarks and leptons? In all these pieces, I'm connecting the concept of the study of the tiniest bits of matter um, and the Big Bang and the origin of the universe. And so I've included images of dark matter mapping as well as references to the collision of particles. At Fermilab, scientists study another group of particles called neutrinos. Our universe is permeated with neutrinos. They're nearly massless, neutral particles that interact so rarely with other matter that trillions of them are passing through our body each second. In this piece, I've constructed a kind of curtain that suggests a theatrical space as a way to present a series of these mysterious particles. So subtle shades of silver, 
steel, and gold represent the three flavors of neutrino particles. Scientists hope to one day discover why these particles oscillate between three flavors. So more on this when uh, Kirsty's gonna be talking in a minute. <clears throat> Neutrinos emanate from the earth, from the sun, they arrive from the distant cosmos, and neutrinos are manufactured at Fermilab with sophisticated technology that begins with a small bottle of hydrogen. It's like about this big, actually. So scientists, um, the piece in this piece, I'm portraying the billions of neutrinos in the beam as an elegant cascade of metallic fibers. So my scientific collaborator, Dr. Don Lincoln, calculated in his head, I might add, that I used about three miles of metallic embroidery floss to create this piece and this one. In both pieces, I'm using the visual metaphor of nets to suggest how detectors capture images of these rarely interacting and elusive particles. The art borrows techniques used in high fashion to project an image of dark glamour. Here, the detector is represented by the velvet squares that are joined with beads in three subtle shades of colors. Again, I'm using the three colors of seed beads to express the dynamic nature of neutrinos. I was interested in learning about the science of high energy physics, but I was also curious about the actual experiments. I was given permission to undertake rigorous radiation safety training in order to accompany operators into the guts of the experiments. I had a privileged view of not only the hardware used in these experiments, but the people who maintain and operate them. Accelerator science is all about riding a bucking bronco of particles. And because the particles in this beam all have the same charge, they want to spread out. So more than 1,000 superconducting magnets are strategically placed around the ring, and they steer and compress the particles that are traveling at near the speed of light. Then the particles are shot into a target, and sometimes, but rarely, neutrinos collide with other particles, and scientists can use that information to study their behavior. Without this complex machinery, neutrinos interact so rarely that it would be impossible to study them in one person's lifetime. I created a series of drawings representing the powerful magnetic forces that steer and control the neutrino beam. I've used wet on wet ink, which is difficult to control, to express the magnetic forces that control the particles. To be successful, my projects need a few key ingredients. First, the artwork must be grounded on a solid scientific foundation. I interview scientists and other staff, tour the experiments, take training, and read deeply. I design my projects as a full immersion experience, and out of this scaffolding, I create accessible art that helps explain scientific concepts. This struggle to understand a particular corner of science is for me a powerful creative catalyst. Second, I employ all my training as an artist to make accessible, impactful art. Images can touch people in places where words often cannot. And I know that I only have like a few brief seconds to snag the attention of the viewer. So it's important to me that the artwork stands on its own. Even if someone is not interested um, in the science, they can still enjoy the art. The last ingredient is passion. There are strict rules defining what activities qualify as scientific research. But before an experiment begins and after it's completed, there is plenty of room for an emotional connection. My goal is to lure in science phobic people with handsome art and then blow their minds with cool science. One of the most powerful lessons I learned from the residency is that I'm not afraid to learn any kind of science, even high energy physics. Both science and art are expressions of our humanity and scientists have been alone with the facts for long enough it's time to invite poets, novelists, musicians, playwrights, singers, and artists and others to help amplify the message that science is an elegant necessity of modern life. And now I want others to know what I have learned, that you don't need a PhD to fall in love with physics. Well, thank you. And I believe that we're gonna split up our Q&A as decided. Um, so yeah. that um, we'll have the art side and the science side, or perhaps both together. Yeah, so um, we've had several um, comments slash questions. Uh, Fiona, first of all, just said, Lindsay Olson's art is awesome, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. 
And then she also, so this was early on, I think in your particles, particle soup um, piece, uh, she, she asked what you mean by um, the democratic use of textiles? Ah, that's a good question. Um, if you're thinking about textiles in the complete price range, you know, a lot of times in fashion, they, they, there's the high fashion that uses the most expensive materials you can possibly find. Hand embroidered or specialty embroidered, re-embroidered laces with heavy beading and stuff like that. Um, very expensive heavyweight silks, um, linens from Belgium, which is like the linen capital of the world. So I wanted to include all different kinds of textiles like common use, like denim, something that everyone can wear, everyone can afford, and canvas. And like, uh, I think I included some uh, shirts and stuff like that. So it's, it's the experience for me at the lab was seeing that it wasn't just theoretical people who are coming up with ideas about physics. The whole lab functions because there's operators who control, you know, test to make sure the magnets are all lined up perfectly so that the beam is giving the ideal conditions for perfect beam. Um, there's people who are cleaning the lab, which where would we be without people who are cleaning? I think right now during COVID, we really appreciate all the people that it takes for us to do our jobs. And so I wanted to use um, textiles that were from the complete price range spectrum to kind of mm, subtly reinforce this idea that particle physics is a team sport. Everybody's involved. Yeah, great, great, great. So, um, and, and Fiona also just asked um, um, of, I think of Fermilab tours are people who do not have science degrees allowed inside. And we answered this in the chat, but I think it's important to, to also get this on, on recording. Yes, it's wonderful. Fermilab is so, they have docents who are trained and trained and trained um, to be able to relate something that seems very abstract and obscure to everybody. And that was one of the most remarkable and wonderful discoveries that if you get yourself to the lab, there's so many resources, whether online or in person, to help you uh, learn these concepts. And the, honestly, everybody at the lab will meet you at your place. So if you have taken physics in like high school or college, they can speak to you on that level. If you have no science background, there's plenty of people to discuss on that ground. And, you know, there's a lot, there's like a whole cohort of very people who are very into particle physics in a casual way uh, or slightly professional way. And they're very up for discussing, um, scientists are very up to discussing those people who have a particular passion for some of the more obscure elements of high energy physics. So it's very welcoming. Great, great, great. And then uh, just one more comment from Catherine, your art is amazing, so. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Fiona. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think that's, that's probably good to go for, for this section. So we'll move on. And then if anyone has any questions um, for, for Lindsay, um, just shoot them on in the chat and we can address them at, at the end. Um, so I think, I think before there was some questions, um, you know, as we move on to Kirsty, um, there was some questions maybe uh, that, that, that she can kind of clear up. What is kind of CERN and Fermilab just kind of at a, you know, maybe at a broad sense. Oh, okay. So uh, both CERN, hi everyone, I'm Kirsty. <laughs> uh, both CERN and Fermilab are particle accelerator labs. Uh, so they both have these huge machines that Lindsay showed a picture of in her first slide um, that are trying to accelerate particles and then smash them into each other. Um, either into each other or into other stuff. But the general aim behind particle accelerators is you get particles going really fast and you smash them at stuff. Um, and what we're trying to do is basically see what happens when you smash them together and if we can create new particles. Um, and that's how we learn about all of these particles that Lindsay presented in the standard model. Um, a lot of them were first only ever seen in particle accelerators like this. So Fermilab for a long time had uh, the world's highest energy particle accelerator. It was called the Tevatron, uh, which is a great name. That was uh, the kind of leading particle accelerator in the world up until, I'm gonna get the dates wrong, but I wanna say about 2010 when uh, CERN turned on their big accelerator, which is called the LHC. It stands for Large Hadron Collider. Hadrons are a type of particle. Um, 
the CERN accelerator is really big when they say large. The Fermilab one is about four miles around, so it's pretty big. The CERN one, I think, is 27 miles around. So it, it like goes under cities and then out of the city and then back again. Um, but both of them are uh, doing the same kind of physics, just with different machines. Um, so there's some friendly competition there, but actually these days we work together a lot. So there's a lot of scientists at Fermilab who are actually working on the machines based in CERN. Okay. All right. I think that that probably covers that. So great. So if you want to kind of continue um, maybe in, in, um, with your presentation. Yeah, cool. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I think you can all see that. Uh, so as I said, my name is Kirsty. Uh, you've seen what I look like, so you know that I look uh, almost but not entirely completely unlike this picture. My presentation, uh, this is art and science. So aim number one of my presentation is to give you a new appreciation of Lindsay's art by showing you how bad art can be if you really try. Um, but we might be there already. I also have some pictures um, and I wanted, when I was planning this talk, I thought I would start with a childhood picture of me looking very cute. And I would tell you that I've been interested in physics since I was a little kid and you'd all think I was adorable. Um, so I asked my mum for a picture and according to my mum, there are zero cute childhood pictures of me and there's only weird, awkward preteen ones. Uh, so thanks mum. This is a picture of me in my super cool star jeans on the beach with my brother and sister. Um, but actually this is uh, quite appropriate because I was about nine or 10 um, when this picture was taken. And around that age, I had this book, uh, the Smarties book of all the incredible facts you ever need to know. Uh, Smarties is a type of candy in the UK. I know there's Smarties in America, but they're different. Smarties in the UK are kind of more like M&Ms. Uh, but this book taught me uh, some really great things, like a cockroach can live for a week without a head. Um, and a man once fell out of a plane without a parachute, but he survived because he hit a load of really tall trees on the way down that slowed him down, and then he landed in a snowdrift. Um, but the other thing that it taught me is that everything is made out of atoms, and atoms are made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And at the time, I thought that was like the coolest thing I'd ever heard. Um, you know, everything is a lot of different stuff. And all the stuff I've ever seen in my life seems quite different. You know, my laptop is clearly made out of different stuff than my table, which is made of different stuff than my hair. How does it make sense that all of those are made of one thing called atoms? And that then those atoms are made of just three things called protons, neutrons and electrons. That seems really weird. And, you know, how does it work? Where does it stop? Are those protons, neutrons, and electrons made of smaller things? Do we get down to like one thing again or does it spread out? Um, I was like super into this as a kid. And I remember asking my parents if protons and neutrons and electrons were made out of smaller things and they did not know. And I asked my teacher in school and, uh, you know, elementary school teachers are not generally taught high energy physics. So I think that was a bit of a surprise for her. But that's kind of where I got my start in physics. Um, and it wasn't a linear progression by any means, but I think you can draw a line from me reading this book as a kid to now being a particle physicist. Uh, so let's talk about physics. Um, the topic of my talk this morning is a brief introduction to neutrino oscillation. And I have a little timer on my screen that tells me we are just over three minutes into this talk and we're already getting into some pretty serious physics jargon. Uh, so I think we can all agree it's going well so far and I'm doing great. <laughs> but don't worry, we're gonna get into what both of these words mean. And I'm gonna start with the first one, which is neutrino. So. Neutrinos are a type of fundamental particle. Um, and if you remember when I was asking if protons and neutrons and electrons are made of other things and where does it stop? 
Fundamental particles is where it stops. They're the things that we think are not made of anything else. They're the smallest possible things. And Lindsay told us about the standard model of particle physics and all of the different particles it predicts. And it predicts uh, in total 12 different fundamental particles. And some of them are neutrinos. So these fundamental particles are the smallest building blocks of matter. Um, they make up atoms, which make up molecules, which make up everything, and it makes up the universe. Um, you might also sometimes hear people, or maybe even me, say neutrinos are subatomic particles. That just means, uh, subatomic means smaller than an atom. Uh, so for example, protons and neutrons and electrons are subatomic particles, but protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. It turns out they are made of something else called quarks. Okay, but that is our particle physics. Neutrinos are a fundamental particle is all we really need to know. Neutrinos are incredibly common in nature. Even though you've never heard of them, they are everywhere. Uh, we get neutrinos from the sun. They're created actually in the center of the earth. The kind of lava and magma that's in the center of the earth is making neutrinos. Um, they're created in showers when particles from outer space hit our atmosphere, which happens a lot more than you would think it does. Um, well, they're made in nuclear reactors and we even get them in foods like bananas. So this little V symbol that I've been drawing everywhere is the Greek letter mu, which is the symbol for neutrinos. And as you can kind of see on my excellently drawn picture, neutrinos are everywhere. Uh, in fact, neutrinos are the most abundant matter particle in the universe. So in the time it took for that little circle to come up on your screen, about 100 million neutrinos passed through it. And most of them are coming from the sun. But the other weird thing about neutrinos is that they're everywhere, but they almost never do anything. 100 million neutrinos pass through every square centimeter of your body every second for your entire life. But on average, in your entire lifetime, only one or two will actually hit an atom in your body and interact. The rest of them just go straight through you like you're not even there. Wait, I need to check. Okay, there we go. We've got the diagram. <laughs> And you might have heard people say um, that an atom is mostly empty space. Atoms are made of a nucleus, which is really tight in the middle, and electrons around the outside. But actually, most of what makes up the whole size of an atom is nothing. That is a thing that seems very weird to think about, because for us, in my experience, when I touch things, they're pretty solid. Uh, but it is very true if you're a neutrino. Neutrinos are so small that they almost always just go through the space in between atoms and don't even notice that they're there. Um, but very rarely, if we're lucky, every so often one will actually hit the nucleus or an electron in an atom and interact, and then we can study them. Um, and at this point, there's another thing I should tell you about neutrinos, which is that they are completely invisible. And you might think that that's just because they're so small, like you've never seen a single atom but if you have fancy equipment like an electron scanning microscope or an atomic force microscope, you can. You can make pictures of individual atoms. It's very cool. Uh, but that is not the same thing as a neutrino. So almost every other type of particle we know about, we're able to build something that can detect them. Um, if they're too small for a microscope, then we can usually see them in particle detectors. But we have never in the history of humanity built a detector that can see a neutrino. So the only way we can ever actually tell that neutrinos are there is on the rare occasion that a neutrino interacts with an atom. And what we see isn't the neutrino itself, but we see the effect on that atom and we see any particles that are kicked out of the nucleus or new particles that are made in the interaction. We see those, but we don't see the neutrino itself. But we've been quite successful about it. Um, using these very rare interactions, we've managed to learn some things about neutrinos. Uh, we know that there are actually three types of neutrino. We call them electron, muon, and tau neutrinos, and we write them like this. So that V symbol is our Greek letter uh, nu for neutrino. And then there's a little E for electron neutrino, a little Greek letter mu for muon neutrino, or a Greek letter tau for the tau neutrino. Okay, so that was a kind of introduction to neutrinos. 
And now we get to the fun part, which is oscillation. Uh, so one of the reasons that I'm really excited about neutrinos is they are incredibly weird particles. And the story of how they're weird starts uh, with this guy called Ray Davis in the 1960s. Uh, so this is an actual photo of him standing in the detector he built. Um, this, in my opinion, is a better photo of him swimming in the detector. Uh, and this is my, I think we agree, excellent artist impression. Okay, so Ray Davis uh, built an experiment to measure neutrinos produced from the sun. Um, I think I said before that of the 100,000 neutrinos per square centimeter per second that are streaming through us, almost all of them come from the sun. So there's loads of neutrinos being produced in the sun all the time. His idea to measure it was he had this big tank that was filled with 600 tons of cleaning fluid. Um, and the reason he chose cleaning fluid is it contains chlorine. Um, only electron neutrinos are produced in the sun. So I told you there's three types of neutrinos. Only one of them, electron neutrinos, is produced in the sun. And Davis knew that, so he built his experiment specifically to detect electron neutrinos. And the idea was that if an electron neutrino interacted with one of those atoms of chlorine in his detector, it would turn it into an argon atom. And so what Davis would do would be to look for argon atoms in his detector, and if he saw them, he would know that there had been electron neutrinos there. Okay, but here's the problem. I talked before about how neutrinos almost never interact, um, but this is a really solid example. Out of his 600 tons of cleaning fluid in his detector, Davis expected about 36 argon atoms to be produced every month. So out of 600 tons of stuff, he's looking for 30 individual atoms so that he can do his experiment. It's unbelievably needle in a haystack. But he did the experiment anyway, and what he found was about half the number of argon atoms he was expecting to see. So, you know, at first everyone said, well, it's a hard experiment. You know, neutrinos almost never interact. You're looking for 30 atoms out of 600 tons of stuff. It's, you know, just don't feel too bad that you got it wrong. You, you did a good effort. Uh, but it turned out that he actually didn't get it wrong. Eventually, Davis's results were confirmed by other experiments, uh, both in the US, Japan, and I think in Russia as well. Um, so if the experiment wasn't wrong, then people said, okay, you know, you've got the experiment right, but you don't really know what's going on in the sun. Like, it's not like we can go there and check. So sure, you measured something that's different from what you expected, but how well did you really know what to expect anyway? But it turns out that wasn't the answer too. Um, we now know the answer and it is much wilder than anyone originally thought. Um, as I said, only one type of neutrino is produced in the sun, the electron neutrino. And so Davis's experiment was specifically built to only see electron neutrinos. We now know the reason he didn't see the right amount is that as neutrinos travel through the sun, they can change into different types. So by the time they reach the Earth, half of those neutrinos have turned into muon or tau neutrinos that the experiment can't see. And so that's the reason Davis only saw half of what he expected because he missed all of the other ones. Um, that's a nice explanation, but it's also incredibly weird. Um, particles changing from one into another is kind of like throwing a ball to your friend and as it flies, it changes color from red to yellow to blue and then red and then yellow and blue again. It doesn't make any sense. You should have one particle and it should be the same particle. How can it turn into a different one? And uh, you see, it's really very simple. The derivation of neutrino oscillations is similar to the derivation of, no, I'm joking. Uh, it's not simple. It's incredibly complicated quantum mechanics. Um, it's so complicated that there have been multiple Nobel Prizes awarded for discoveries related to the way neutrinos change. Um, but we are not going to go into Nobel Prize level quantum mechanics today. Instead, I'm going to go with an analogy. So imagine you had a pair of glasses that for some reason, someone has put thick black tape over most of the glasses. So when you look out, you can only see like a sliver of the outside world and the rest of it is blacked off. And now imagine you're holding a beach ball 
But because of these glasses, when you look down at the ball you're holding, all you see is a sliver at the top of the ball and the sliver that you see is red. So you think to yourself, I'm holding a red ball. And then you throw the ball to a friend who is also wearing the same kind of glasses. And your friend looks down and they see a sliver of blue. And so you think to yourselves, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We've got a magic color changing ball. When I had it, it was red. And then when you have it, it was blue. This is fantastic. We're going to be rich. This is great. But of course, we know really that you don't have a magic ball. And unfortunately, you're not going to be rich. Um, what you have is a beach ball. But the way that you're able to look at that beach ball isn't able to kind of truly reflect the full object that you're holding. And that's basically what we think is happening with neutrinos. When we measure a neutrino, um, by the way we measure it, we can only measure one flavor. So we can only see electron, muon, or tau neutrino, which is like one color on our beach ball. But when it travels, it travels as a beach ball. So when it travels, it's actually some mixture of all three types of neutrino. And that means that the next time you look at it, there's some chance that you're gonna see a different color or measure a different type of neutrino. The technical name for this, the, the name for neutrinos changing from one type to another is neutrino oscillation. So we finally explained our words. Um, and of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that because it always has to be. Uh, for one thing, we think there are at least three beach balls where each one has different amounts of the three colors, uh, which is like there being three kind of real neutrinos and each one of them has a different probability that every time you look at it, you're going to see it as red or you're going to see it as blue. And so you can see like on the one on the left hand side, it's much more likely that you're going to see blue if you just randomly looked at one bit of it. Whereas on the right hand side, it's less likely you're going to see blue and more likely you're going to see red or yellow. And another thing is that technically quantum mechanics says that when you look at the ball and see red, it really is a red ball and it doesn't become a beach ball until you throw it. And then as soon as your friend catches it and looks and sees blue, somehow magically it is a blue ball again. Uh, I don't have a good analogy for that other than quantum mechanics is really strange. Um, and I think we always knew it was weird. But the really cool thing about this discovery, um, other than the fact that particles are changing into other particles and that's weird and therefore awesome on its own, is that it opens up a huge amount of potential more questions. Um, so one question we can ask is why it happens at all. Why are neutrinos beach balls? And why are they not just regular red, blue, and yellow balls like we originally expected? Uh, the answer to that is quite technical. Uh, neutrino oscillation is a quantum mechanical effect. It is pure quantum mechanics. And it only happens if neutrinos have mass. And that might sound like not a particularly exciting thing for me to say. But the reason it is exciting is in the standard model that Lindsay told us about, which is everything we currently know about particle physics, the standard model says that neutrinos cannot have mass. Um, so Lindsay said, you know, she tied the standard model on very loosely to show that it might need to be ripped up and rewritten. This is the first evidence we have that it does need to be rewritten because it says neutrinos don't have mass and we found that they do. And that was thought to be impossible, like right up until it was discovered and then also a little bit afterwards because no one believed Ray Davis. Um, and the exciting thing about that, as I said, is neutrino oscillation is proof that our understanding of the universe isn't complete. Um, and to particle physicists, that is super exciting because it means that there's more for us, for all of us to learn and discover and kind of add to general knowledge about the universe. Okay. So hopefully we are now all on board with the idea that neutrinos are the most exciting particle ever. Uh, Fermilab would agree with you. So we talked a little bit about Fermilab already. This is a picture of it. This is the main building called Wilson Hall, uh, which is very cool. Um, it's about an hour outside of Chicago. So it's about two and a half hours, I think, from uh, University of Illinois. And researchers at Fermilab are working on seven different neutrino experiments, all based at the lab. 
And we don't have seven hours to talk about all of them in detail. So I'm just going to pick one that I work on, which is called June. It stands for the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. This is a photo of me and my 200 closest collaborators. Um, it's actually less than a quarter of the total people. There's about a thousand or even more than a thousand people in total working on this experiment. So it's absolutely huge. June hasn't been built yet. It's a future experiment that we're going to build at Fermilab. And the aim is going to be to study the way neutrinos oscillate, the way they change from one flavor to another in real detail. And the hope is that when we do that, we might be able to use neutrinos to answer one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in science, which is why does the universe exist? And to explain that question a little bit more, uh, it relates to antimatter, which if you haven't heard of it or you've only heard of it in sci-fi, uh, it is a real thing. As it sounds, it is the opposite of matter. So every type of particle in the standard model has a related antiparticle, which is the same but opposite in basically every way you can think of. Uh, so an electron, for example, has a negative charge. The anti-electron, which is called the positron, has positive charge. Uh, we can even you know, do like the proton, which has positive charge. You can make an antiproton, which has negative charge. And Physics is all about kind of things being in balance. And uh, one of the kind of consequences of that is if you work through the maths, if you have a piece of matter and a piece of antimatter and you bring them together, they will destroy each other. When they get together, they destroy the particles and there's nothing left over except energy. And so that's important because uh, we think the Big Bang that made the universe made equal amounts of matter and antimatter. But if that's true, then in the 13 billion years since the Big Bang, those bits of matter and antimatter should have come together and they should have destroyed each other and there should be nothing left. Uh, so the question is, why are we here? And one possible answer to that could be in the way that neutrinos change. Um, so if neutrinos and antineutrinos are seen to change in slightly different ways, then that would be evidence of physics treating matter and antimatter differently. And then that could potentially explain why the universe is made only of matter. So as I said, June has over a thousand scientists from all around the world working to study the way that neutrinos and antineutrinos change to see if this could be the answer. Um, and the first thing we're gonna do is start by making our own neutrinos using particle accelerators at Fermilab. And that avoids any of those, maybe you just don't know what's going on in the sun problems. Um, so we use a particle accelerator to accelerate protons. We smash that into a target and it produces a whole bunch of particles which decay to produce neutrinos. And then we get our beam of neutrinos that we can use for the experiment. For good measure, we measure the neutrinos just after we've made them in uh, the inventively named near detector because physicists are great at naming stuff. Um, to make sure that we really understand the neutrinos we have before they've changed. And as I said, the particle accelerator and the near detector are both going to be on site at Fermilab in Batavia, Illinois. So after we've measured our neutrinos and we know exactly what we have, we're going to send them over a long distance to give them time to change. We're actually going to send them to a place called Leed in South Dakota, which is about 800 miles away. And an obvious question to ask at this point is, are we going to dig a tunnel 800 miles from Illinois to South Dakota for our neutrinos? And the answer is no. Because neutrinos hardly ever interact, you don't actually need to dig a tunnel for them to go through. You just fire them through the Earth. So you just point the neutrinos into the ground. They go through the gaps between the atoms in the Earth. The Earth kind of curves above them, and they pop out again at the right place in South Dakota. And of course, in South Dakota, we're going to measure them again in what we call the far detector because we are just as creative as we were a couple of minutes ago. Um, and the idea is that in the time it takes for these neutrinos to go through the Earth, some of them will change. So we compare what we measured at the beginning to what we measured at the end and see how many of the neutrinos have changed. And the plan is we're going to do this with neutrinos and then we're going to do it again with antineutrinos and see if we see them changing differently. 
And we don't really know yet what we're going to find, but we know for sure that whatever it is, we're going to learn new things about nature and the fundamental building blocks of the universe. Um, and we have the potential to solve one of the biggest unsolved questions in science. So that is the end of my talk, but I will repeat that all of you that are local or on site at the University of Illinois should come and visit Fermilab when coronavirus is over and we're able to open up again. Uh, currently, obviously the site is shut down. I'm not even allowed into Fermilab. But once everything opens up, the site is open to the public. All you need is an ID. Um, it can just be a driver's license or something. Um, I think it might have to be a real ID, but you don't need to be a US citizen, I'm not. Um, there's public areas that you can go see by yourself, uh, which includes a herd of bison, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's also regular public tours that will take you to see some bits of the experiments and explain the science that's going on. Uh, so if you want to find out more, check the website because I'm sure they're gonna update all the tours there when they can. Cool. Awesome, thanks. Thanks so much, Kirsty. Um, I think Yoni has a, has a quick comment so my son will be making a cameo. Um, but so Kirsty, thanks so much. That was a really nice talk. Um, and I just wanted to mention a really fun thing that I discovered a couple of years ago about an art science connection between neutrino oscillations and that experiment that Ray Davis did. Um, so Arthur Clarke, the famous science fiction author actually wrote a book during the time between when Ray Davis did an experiment and before we'd figured out the deficit was due to neutrino oscillations. And that was actually the plot twist on which his entire book hung that, oh my God, they've discovered that the sun is not emitting the right amount of neutrinos. Therefore, the sun's gonna blow up. Everyone has to escape the solar system. Let's go send all of our art to another planet. And then actually there's a whole debate about how do we pick which Mozart symphonies to send? Because there's an issue of, you don't have enough storage space to store all of humanity's you know, art collections and anything. I forget what the title of the book is, but I found like an original edition in a used bookstore or something. Um, so if anybody knows which book, um, it's just so cool that it kind of, you know, the progress of science can actually influence art and there can kind of be this, this back and forth. So thanks That's, for reminding me of that. Yeah, thank you. That's really cool. Um, there is, there's a film which, I don't know, it might be the film based on that book, I'm not sure. Um, and I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but the plot of the film as well is the neutrinos are mutating and somehow that is going to destroy the earth or destroy the sun, uh, which if you're a massive nerd like me, it's hilarious because the neutrinos are mutating, but it doesn't matter because they're not going to do anything anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll just uh, go to a few uh, questions. Um, we have quite a number of them, so we'll just kind of kick it off now. So um, S. Cox wrote, are there more neutrino particles than dark matter particles, uh, whatever they are? That is a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I know neutrinos, originally people thought they could be a candidate for dark matter because they hardly ever interact, um, which is another thing that we know about dark matter. The only way we've seen dark matter is by uh, the effect it has on gravity. Um, so we know it's there because it affects gravity, which means it has mass, um, but we've never seen it interact any other way, which is very similar to neutrinos. They have mass, they almost never interact. Um, it turns out now that we are able to measure neutrinos, they are not dark matter. Um, so we think dark matter is something else. And actually neutrinos are an annoyance if you're trying to measure dark matter because you keep seeing the neutrinos instead. Um, I don't know if there would be more dark matter than neutrinos. I think no. No, I take it back. I'm not sure. Um, because actually there's uh, isn't it something like 79% of the universe is dark matter? Um, that makes me think there's probably more. Uh, but as you've seen, you probably can't trust me either way. Measured response. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so Bar Barbara asks, uh, you have used flavor, um, quote in quotes, in describing various neutrinos. Is there sig a significance to that use? No, that's another good question, though. We... Um, we basically have been making up words to describe the different types of different particles. Uh, so for example, quarks is another type of particle. Um, we'd already used type. So when they had to describe the different types of quarks, they came up with color, which does not mean quarks are literally colored, uh, but they call them colored. 
And so then with neutrinos, we've gone through type, we've gone through color. I don't know who came up with flavor, but it, it's just another word for the type of neutrino. Yeah. Um, and then Michael, uh, some sort of uh, tongue in cheek, which flavor of neutrino tastes best? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we won't press you on that one. Uh, David asks, what about the interaction between neutrinos passing through the sun or the Earth's core um, changes them? Good. Yeah, so good question. So there's actually two things. The one I really talked about was um, just time, that they, they change over time. And so the kind of significance of them traveling is actually just... Um, you know, that it takes them some time to travel and then they've had time to change. There is actually another effect that we call the matter effect that they change differently when they travel through something like the sun or the earth's core. Um, the reason they change differently is kind of complicated, but it's basically to do with the fact that um, you have electrons in atoms. And so there's an extra interaction you can have between the electron and the electron neutrino that you can't have between the electron and the muon neutrino or the tau neutrino. Uh, so when they travel through matter, it actually makes them change a bit differently because it kind of favors electron neutrinos. Um, but yeah, those are two different things. Even if they were traveling through empty space, they would still change just because of the time it takes. Yep. Okay. So Jay asks, how can you know at Leeds that a neutrino is your neutrino that changed? Yeah, that is another good question. Um, there's, there's two ways we try and do that. Uh, one is just by, we know when we turn the accelerator on, so we can check that there are more neutrinos when the accelerator is on than when it's off. Um, and that's actually something we do in all our experiments. Um, the other thing is that there's, you can kind of look at the direction they're coming. So you can't see the direction of the neutrino because you can't see the neutrino. But kind of conservation of momentum, if a neutrino is coming in this way and it hits an atom and it makes stuff, the stuff is gonna kind of go that way. And it's not perfect, um, but you can generally tell if the stuff seems to be going forwards away from Illinois, then it's probably one of ours. Whereas if it seems to be going down, it's probably coming from the sun. If it seems to be going up, it's probably coming from the earth. Okay. So, okay, great. So Michael asks, how do you make or detect anti-neutrinos? Um, basically in the same way you make normal neutrinos. Uh, so I showed, I showed a picture of the way we make neutrinos is we take a beam of protons, we smash it into a target of stuff. It doesn't really matter so much what stuff is. Uh, people use graphite or you can use beryllium. And then you get out a load of different types of particles. And one of the most important is called a pion, uh, which is a new exotic type of particle we don't really see most of the time. But pions uh, have a charge. So you can have a pi plus, which is a positively charged pion, or a pi minus, which is a negatively charged pion. And they decay, and a pi plus will decay to produce a neutrino. A pi minus will decay to produce an antineutrino. So kind of up until that stage of making pions, it's all the same. And then what you do is you use magnets to try and focus the pions you want in the right direction and the pions you don't want away. So when you want to make neutrinos, you focus the positive ones in and the negative ones away. When you want antineutrinos, you just flip the kind of switch on your magnets. So the negative ones are going in and the positive ones are going out of the way. Okay, well, great. Yeah, this kind of leads into the next question. Are neutrinos affected by magnetic fields? And I think you yeah. just answered that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not at all. Uh, oh, so yeah, all. that's yeah. when you're making, so the pions are, but the neutrinos are not. Okay. So you have to try and focus your pions in the right direction. And then you just hope that the neutrinos go the right way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maximizing success, huh? <laughs> And uh, I think Barbara, um, we were talking about that book, and Barbara uh, said the Clark book is the song of distant Earth. Ah, cool. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, thanks, Barbara, for that. Um, so, let's see. Vishal asks, why do neutrinos have any inherent velocity? Good mm. question. So there's, there's kind of two things. Um, 
One is the the way we make them, right? Like you make them yeah. from these decays. And so they have some energy, which means they have velocity. The other thing is um, special relativity tells us that if something is traveling at the speed of light, if something has no mass, sorry, it always travels at the speed of light and it can't be still. So like light can never be still, it's always traveling. Mm -hmm. Neutrinos have some mass, that was a, a big thing, but um, their mass is actually really, really, really tiny, um, which means it's very hard to get a neutrino to sit still and they just always prefer to be moving. And it's basically because it's so light, if you give it any amount of kick, it's gonna just go. Um, you know, where something is heavy, you push it and it might, if it's a ball, it might roll a bit and then stop. It's so light that it's just gonna fly off all the time. Yeah, okay. And then James asks, were you involved in the first experiment on neutrino oscillation involving the Sudan mine in Minnesota? Is that still working? Uh, no and no. So that experiment was called MINOS. Um, that sent neutrinos, again from Fermilab, as you said, up to the Sudan mine in northern Minnesota. Um, I was not involved in that, but um, my PhD advisor was on MINOS. I used to work, so after MINOS came uh, another experiment at Fermilab called NOVA, which also sent neutrinos up to Minnesota. I didn't work on NOVA, I worked on its, uh, its competitor. So like we talked about how Fermilab and CERN are kind of friendly competition. Uh, in neutrinos, the competition is between Fermilab and Japan. So I actually used to work on the, the one in Japan. Uh, and the second part is Minos is no longer working. It has been taken down. And actually, I have a little bit of Minos in my apartment somewhere because when they took it down, they handed out little bits of the detector, which is pretty cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So Stuart asks, um, I'd always read that neutrinos and anti-neutrinos were distinct, but recently heard a physicist say that this is an open question, that each flavor of neutrino might be its own anti-particle. Is that indeed open and can it be tested? Yes, that I think, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say this because it's not what I work on, but I think that is the most exciting question about neutrinos. Um, so every other type of particle we know um, the particle and the antiparticle are different. Um, and I said that kind of antimatter, everything you can think of is opposite. And with neutrinos, it turns out that there's actually nothing that has to be opposite. So it doesn't have any charge. So it's not like you would have a positive neutrino and a negative antineutrino is neutral. Um, and it's not necessarily that they are definitely the same, but it's possible that they could be. Um, it's a different type of particle called Majorana particle, named after some guy called Majorana that invented it. Um, the way you could test it is pretty cool. Um, you get neutrinos produced in beta decay. So where a neutron inside an atom turns into a proton and it kind of kicks out a neutrino and an electron. Um, and you can get double beta decay where basically two of those happen at the same time in the same nucleus. So you get two electrons and two neutrinos. If the neutrino is its own antiparticle, then those two neutrinos could annihilate against each other and destroy each other and there'd be nothing left. So the way to look for it is to look for what they call neutrinoless double beta decay, where you get two electrons and no neutrinos. Um, mm. It will probably not surprise you to know that that is incredibly difficult to do experimentally. Um, people are trying, they're building really, really sensitive detectors. Um, I think uh, we're getting to the point where we might be able to measure it, but we're not quite there yet. But in the next kind of 10, 20 years, I think it will be really exciting. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And then, so Rhea asks, are there anti-neutrons? Yes, there are anti-neutrons. Um, so neutrons are made of three quarks. Um, there are two down quarks, which is a type of quark, and then one up quark. I mean, we talked about like flavor and charge, and we got really inventive with naming the quarks. There's up, down, top, bottom, and then charm and strange. Um, but neutrons are made of two, uh, two downs and one up. And you can make an anti-neutron with two anti-downs and one anti-up. Oh. Um, I don't know if anyone has actually made one uh, because 
it's harder with like a composite particles because you probably have to make the antiquarks and then somehow mash them together. And I know they've managed to make an antiproton and then they managed to put it together with an anti-electron to make an anti-hydrogen atom. Um, but I don't know if they've managed to make an anti-neutron. But in theory, it's definitely possible. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So that was kind of a, <laughs> just a, a, a shotgun, you know, kind of round of, of questions. So thanks. Thanks for for um, you know answering all those. So um, we had one, I think, you know, going back to Lindsay's section um, that I missed, and sorry about that, Lindsay. But if you want to maybe. Uh, um, answer, or maybe you can kind of point to your slide on this, but one person asked, could you please show that representation of the Higgs boson in your background material in your piece? I think, you know, you kind of um, showed it um, in several, several pictures, but. Sure, I'd be glad to. I'm pulling it up right now. So let me see. This was the first piece that I showed my uh, collaborator, Dr. Don Lincoln. And you can see that I've embroidered these tiny little H's in the background. Okay. I actually did that for all the standard model pieces. There's six of them. And if you look in chat, um, there's a link to my website where you can see all of the artwork and there's some information about the residency at Fermilab and another science art event that's happening in February called, uh, part, what did I, I have to look at the name again in the chat, um, Particles. But anyway, there's a link to that all in chat. You can um, take a look at that. And it, does that answer your question? Yeah, yep, I think so, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so the event at Fermilab is Be a Part of Particles. Very clever title. <laughs> yeah, and I know, you know, I'm just gonna repeat it again because I think it's important, but um, there was several questions about, um, you know, reaching out to Lindsay for her art, you know, and, and that can all be done through her website. It's up in chat too. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's in the chat. So, um, and then um, there was one kind of comment before of, uh, you know, you, Kirsty, you showed that uh, picture of Davis swimming in the pool. Um, there was kind of one comment. So what is that? Is that water or is that? Uh, oh yeah. What was yeah. he swimming in? Yeah. No, that's a good point. He was not swimming in, uh, in the cleaning fluid yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he actually to uh to shield it um so one of the problems you can have with neutrino experiments is uh i i think i briefly mentioned that we one of the ways to make neutrinos is when we have particles from outer space that hit our atmosphere and they make this huge shower of particles um those can be really annoying when you're trying to see neutrinos because it's like we're in a kind of rain of particles all the time. And so that was kind of part of the reason that he went underground into a mine because the ground stops the particles. And then another thing they did was they put basically water around the detector as kind of extra shielding for stuff coming in from the outside. Um, so what he's swimming in is the water that is on top of the detector. Uh, he is not swimming in the detector. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, just to get that clear. Uh, I and, also, and, and, can I just make a comment? Yeah, sure. I just love how Ray Davis for years was suffering from people like thinking he did the math wrong or his experiment was wrong. He won a Nobel Prize. He was one of the pictures that Kirsty Duffy put up. So I was like, yes. <laughs> just goes to show persistence is key. Yeah, and I know, you know, that you have such a great picture of, I think, the G minus uh, two storage ring. And then so, you know, for those of you who, um, you know, maybe high school students interested in, in kind of doing this type of physics, there are a number of our professors who actually work on the G minus um, two at, at Illinois. So if you're interested in becoming a student um, in our department, um, you'll have the opportunity to maybe do some undergrad research um, uh, at, at Fermilab. So uh, just to get that quick plug in there, I wouldn't be doing my job correctly if, if, if not. So I think um, that is it um, in terms of all the questions. Um, so let me just see. So, uh, so I guess one more, uh, maybe one more. Um, from James, what would be the best possible result from Dune? Uh, can it win a Nobel Prize? And I think that's kind of maybe more for Kirsty. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that is the hope. Um, the hope, I think, for June is that we will measure neutrinos being different from antineutrinos. Um, the kind of technical word for that is CP violation. It's never been measured in neutrinos before. The hope is that we measure it in June, and I think that would be Nobel Prize worthy if it was measured. All right. Well, great. I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, and and we had you know several great um, you know uh, comments on on you know just just. Um, you know, kind of saying how clear your illustrations uh, for both of you were and, and clear how clear the presentation. So thank you so much for um, sharing uh, your time with us. And we hope to hopefully maybe get you back, um, you know, at some point soon, right? So, and, and thank, to, uh, thank you to all of our attendees for attending today's session. And this will be available for recording and uh, will be distributed um, to all of you after um, the session in a few days. So uh, great, and thank you so much. Um, and everyone, uh, please stay safe. Thank you, Kirsty, and thank you, Patrick. Yeah, Bye -bye. thank you both. Bye.